sir please sir uh, uh, welcome uh, sir uh, welcome to uh, professor sandeep agarwal from department of pediatric surgery we all know him he doesn't need any uh, introduction uh, uh, i am uh, co-hosting uh, today's program uh, because uh, sanjay rao sir is in the theater so welcome uh, one and all for today's uh, evening program uh, rms staging and uh, risk stratification and principles of management this is one of the uh, very good uh, uh, mm. tuesday ips webinars which are uh, secretary general secretary uh, dr sanjay rao started uh, today he is in a theater so i will be uh, a co host and any issues or any questions i will be uh, uh, i will be uh, sending it across the chat yeah over to you sir sandeep sir please thank you sir okay uh, good evening to all and uh, i think it's a very good initiative by the secretary sanjay <coughs> rao for starting some discussions i just hope that it don't become too many from all the societies it becomes very difficult to attend uh, many of these so today uh, <clears throat> i will be talking on a very specific topic and not try to cover the whole of rms we will talk on the staging the risk stratification and the current principles of management and uh, if there are any any queries please put them in the chat and at the end of the talk we we'll take them up uh, if there is time and as much time is there so uh no how do i move it okay so rms as we all know is the commonest childhood sarcoma and it is the third most common extracranial tumor in children these are the sites of uh, distribution of rms and uh, <clears throat> the common site is head and neck while uh, genital urinary and trunk are the second most common sites uh, we as pediatric surgeons mostly are confronted with genital urinary extremities and trunk and some of the people do head and neck also the sites of rms are divided into favorable sites and unfavorable sites we will see how it helps us in the uh, risk stratification uh, <clears throat> most of the uh, rms in the genital urinary area are embryonal rms in head and neck 60% are embryonal and the rest are alveolar while in extremities and trunk there is need distribution of embryonal rms and a, uh, alveolar rms about 20% of these uh, patients have metastatic disease at presentation mostly it is a single site uh, metastasis but the other sites of metastasis could be of bone and uh, obviously lymph nodes as we have seen the pathology just to touch on it international classification divides them into superior prognosis botryoid and spindle cell which are types of embryonal rms intermediate prognosis is the standard embryonal rms and poor prognosis which in children is mostly alveolar plastic and nos are very uncommon in children these are the standard slides that we see of a standard rms uh, and the spindle cell rms the myogenic investment uh, immunostains are uh, commonly done in these patients there are some prognostic variables that we must uh, know and understand and through the lecture it will become more and more apparent as i mentioned sites unfavorable versus favorable age children less than 1 year of age and more than 10 years of age have poorer outcome as compared children between 2 and 9 years of age the rms has a poorer outcome as we all know and the surgical resectability also there is some uh, indication that the tumors which are completely resected without a microscopic positive margin have a better outcome than those which cannot be resected and have a biopsy only by the event free survival uh, of uh, uh, children who have a complete resection but microscopic positive uh, margin with or without lymph nodes is significantly different for all the three categories in the clinical group cg is clinical group i'll come to that uh, later overall five year event free survival and uh, and overall survival in rms all metastatic and non metastatic is 69% and 79% yeah as of now the metastatic uh, rms have really got a poorer outcome as this table shows that the event free survival and overall survival is still very poor this is where we have failed over the last 4 5 decades in improving the survivals 
and uh, the metastatic sites, more than three sites, bone and bone marrow metastasis fare worse than the other sites of pulmonary metastasis. This is the new uh, cytogenetic evaluation which is necessary now in RMS. That is the PAX3 uh, fusion FOXO1 or PAX7 fusion FOXO1. And these are called fusion, uh, positive or fusion negative. So now one of the current distribution of RMS uh, is fusion positive, that is FP, and fusion negative, that is FN. 80% of the allular RMS are fusion positive. Most of these are PAX3 FOXO1. Some are PAX7 FOXO1. And 95% of the embryonal RMS and 20% of the allular RMS are fusion negative. As we will see in the, in the talk later on, the fusion positive RMS to much poorer than the fusion negative RMS. 80% of the embryonal RMS have a loss of heterozygosity at 11p15.5. And this is important to know because future uh, COG studies have added this fusion positive and fusion negative to the risk stratification so that appropriate treatment can be done to these patients. Data from six COG trials, as mentioned here, including about uh, 1,700 patients, have clearly shown that the outcome of fusion positive patients are poor than the fusion negative patients. As this table shows, that the fusion positive patients in the localized RMS have a much poor event free survival and overall survival, and also in the metastatic RMS. So, when you look at the prognostic factors today, after metastatic status, OXO1 or fusion positive status is the most important prognostic factor in RMS. The staging work workup is standard to know the, the site origin, the extent of the local disease and the spread to the lymph nodes, lungs, the bone marrow aspiration and bone marrow biopsy is done for metastatic spread. The technician bone scan is also done. The role of FDG PET uh, is also coming up slowly, but it is not very well defined as yet. The uh, whole body MR can also be done for metastatic spread. But standard workup as for all sarcomas is done for all children with RMS. When you look at the uh, evolution of therapy for RMS, there have been three main cooperative groups over the last four or five decades. The North American groups, which are the COG, Soft Tissue Sarcoma Committee, now called COG STS, the European Pediatric Surgery Soft Tissue Study Group, EPSSG, and the German CWS group. So there are a lot of studies over the last five decades. Uh, we will not have time to go through most of them, but I will highlight some of the important ones in this. So the first uh, cooperative trial was set up in 1972 in the North America. And through the years from 1972 till date, you have seen that all the IRSG 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 have come up. Now they are not called IRSG, they are called ARST, American Rhabdomyosarcoma Study Trials, ARST. So this table shows the various uh, titles for low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk RMS. And uh, these are just numbers which uh, you don't need to remember, but uh, these are various trials which have been conducted and the results of which now currently uh, tell us what to do. The future, uh, the current trials beyond 2013, I have still not reported uh, as results. So when you look at the staging of these patients, there are two systems which are used in combination. The clinical grouping, CG, which is a surgical pathologic staging, depends upon the receptor resection that has been carried out, and the pre-treatment TNM staging, which is this is a modified TNM staging, and both have been uh, put forward by the uh, IRG. So this is the clinical group, CG, group 1, 2, 3, 4. One, basically, one is completely resected, two is complete resection, but microscopic margins are positive, and in 2C, the lymph nodes are positive, which have been resected. Three is basically a biopsy only, or gross residue. So we'll, we'll have the definitions of these uh, resections later on. And four is metastasis present. So this is clinical grouping. Then there's the TNM staging, which uses all the, that is the site, the tumor invasion, that is T1 or T2, the size of the tum primary tumor, A or B, and regional lymph node positive or negative, and metastasis present or absent. So combining all these factors, which are important in the prognosis, 
we come up with this TNM stage two, three, and four. Basically, all favorable sites, which I have mentioned in the previous slide, the favorable sites are head and neck. In the head and neck, the orbit and non paramaringeal tumors and non bladder prostate genital urinary sites. These are favorable sites. All other sites are unfavorable. So when you look at the staging, all favorable sites, irrespective of T, size of tumor, lymph node metastasis, are stage one. If the metastasis is present, it goes to stage four. Any site, any other uh, criteria, if the metastasis is present, it is stage four. For the favorable, without metastasis, all are stage one. Unfavorable is basically decided on the size of the tumor and the presence of lymph nodes. So these are uh, stage one, two, three, four. Now combining the uh, clinical grouping, CG, and TNM staging, the risk categorization of RMS has been made. So there are two risk categories, low, intermediate, and high. The low is divided into subset A and subset B, and intermediate and high. Now one does not need to remember these. I'll show later on in case, uh, in case uh, examples that we just have these tables and we mark it on the table. Uh, the findings, and then you arrive at the risk categorization. And this risk categorization is a major advancement in the management of RMS because now the treatment of RMS is based on the risk category in these patients. As you see in this, I have marked out in red, all alveolar RMS are either initiated or high risk, and embryonal RMS can be on other. And how are these risk categories divided? So low risk category subset A has an excellent outcome of more than 85 percent, while subset B has a very good outcome of 70 to 85 percent survival. Intermediate risk have good outcome, 50 to 70 percent survival, while patients have a poor, less than 35 percent survival. So we see in this that all the metastatic patients go in high risk, and the others are distributed uh, in, according to this table. Now, in the treatment when we look at this treatment chart. Then subset A is treated either with two drugs alone for 45 weeks or uh, uh, three drug plus two drug for a shorter period of time. All others, that is subset B, intermediate and high risk, basically have the uh, backbone of VAC, back chemotherapy in the American groups. The European groups have a backbone of I IVA, IVA, that is I-phosphamide, Winkristin and actinomycin D. So in the European groups, they have chosen to use iphosphamide instead of cyclophosphamide. They have had a trial in between in which they added doxorubicin, which was called IVADO, but they did not find any, in, any improvement in survival. So I think they are back in IVA. The various trials which are now being conducted are basically looking at the dose uh, de-escalation of cyclophosphamide and also addi addition of additional new drugs that could improve the survival uh, more in, in these patients. Some of the trials have looked at the dosage of radiotherapy also and uh, when it should be given at 4 weeks, 8 weeks or 12 weeks. So this is the low risk uh, subset A. Uh, details you don't need to know in this but you can look at the charts when we are prescribing to the patients. Basically most patients of RMS would get VAC chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy while in the European groups and the German group they will get IVA. So when you look at the principles of chemotherapy, which has evolved over treatment of a large number of patients on the American and the European and the German trials, and the mainstay of chemotherapy, as I mentioned in the last three dec decades, have been a combination of interesting actinomycin D and cyclophosphamide, that is VAC in IRS, and iphosphamide, uh, actinomycin D, and uh, vincristine in the European trials. And de-escalation, is what has been done because of the long-term complications. The most recent low-risk study in the American trial, that is ARST 0331, for intermediate risk, uh, for low-risk uh, patients, have attempted to reduce the burden of treatment. The therapy has been shorted to 24 weeks, and the cumulative dose of cyclophosphamide has also been decreased. It has still maintained an excellent three-year event key survival and overall survival, of 89% and 98%. Another group, uh, the cyclophosphamide dose was decreased and combined with VA for 48 weeks, again, excellent outcome. 
So these are just uh, modulation of dose. But unfortunately, in the last three drug uh, decades, there has been no new drug which is introduced into the treatment of uh, RMS. And as I will highlight later on, we are still stuck at a survival rate which was probably there three decades earlier. So if you look at uh, the treatment, all patients of RMS would get adjuvant chemotherapy. Upfront resection is rarely feasible, especially in India where they come very late and with large tumors. Most of the patients would get new adjuvant chemotherapy or induction chemotherapy as it is called with a delayed local treatment. The local treatment could either be surgery alone or surgery with radiotherapy or radical radiotherapy if, if a safe surgical resection is not possible. Now, one can say and argue that you can resect almost everything or anything, but the aim is not to you know, destroy function as far as possible and to maintain cosmesis and at the same time, maintain a low long-term uh, complication rate and a high survival rate. So the question which comes now and which has been discussed is when should the local treatment be done? At 12 weeks or eight weeks? And there have been studies in that. Now the consensus mostly is at 12 weeks of starting the chemotherapy. So a few words on radiation therapy. This is the place where this is the therapy where there's a lot of philosophical difference between the American and the European cooperative groups. The American groups, the COG, uniformly apply radiotherapy to most of the patients. And the European groups, RT is less applied. And this is especially in younger children because RT has a lot of complications in younger children. And the European groups feel that if a CR is achieved on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then probably RT has no additional benefit. While the American groups uh, still give RT for these patients. And so the overall, there is a better local control by the American groups, but at the cost of more long-term complications. The overall outcome, event-free survival, is not statistically different in both the groups. The timing of RT is also debated. Usually it is delayed to 12 weeks, as I mentioned. For metastatic disease, usually the RT is given beyond five, fifth or sixth month of induction therapy so as not to compromise the chemotherapy. Because once you start RT, then during that period of RT, which is quite prolonged, which could be 30 or 35 days, the uh, only drug which can be given during that time is vincristine. And so the chemotherapy intensity is definitely compromised. So the, in metastatic disease, the RT is delayed. What is the volume of uh, radiotherapy? Mo in simple terms, the pre-treatment uh, CT scan is very important because that is what the volume is going to be plus a two centimeter margin. Sometimes cone down boost is given to the post-treatment volume. So the total radiation increases to the residual tumor. Current RT guidelines is a daily fraction 180 or 200 centigrade and a cumulative dose of 36 grays for R0 tumors and 41.4 grays for R1 tumors. The cumulative dose is higher for sites where radiotherapy is preferred over surgery or radiotherapy or is the main uh, treatment for as local therapy. And the dose is escalated to 59.4 grays if the tumor is more than 5 centimeters in size. So these are some things which we as surgeons should have an idea, but details are left to the our colleagues in radiotherapy department to chart out all these uh, <clears throat> now we come to the most important part, the uh, principles of surgical treatment for RMS. So the complete surgical excision has been the cornerstone of treatment for most sites. And now with multimodal therapy, local control rates have reached about 95%. The evolution of surgery has been over the decades with avoidance of mutilating procedures like pelvic excentration or amputations and emphasis on organ preservation in more than 60% of the cases. But this is comes, we must realize that organ preservation may not always mean normal organ fun function. As I will highlight later on, the anatomical organ is preserved, but it may not have all the normal physiological functions. So that is something which is uh, for us to still solve. And that is why long-term follow-ups in these patients are required. So long-term follow-up is required for recurrence, but also for the defects in physiological function 
or long term complications which can be uh, getting worse over the years so what are the requirements of a surgeon in rms first is the biopsy of the primary or a primary diagnosis which i'll just highlight the regional lymph node evaluation then the excision of primary tumor either as upfront or surgery following a new adjuvant therapy which is called a second look surgery slo in short and a role of primary re excision which i will highlight later and then region specific recommendations which also we will discuss but uh, details of reconstructive surgery i will not be touching upon here uh, because of the want of time so biopsy we must remember that incisional biopsy is preferred for most sites but today with very good uh, coaxial core needle biopsy uh, needles needles available multiple core biopsies may be sufficient if one is doing an incision biopsy the incision should not compromise the ultimate surgery so in the limbs it is always a longitudinal incision vertical incision because if you going to excise this tumor and there is a transverse incision the amount of skin which needs to be excised and the soft tissue which needs to be excised increases and we may not be able to get a primary closure and that is why it is very important to do a proper incision biopsy in these patients regional lymph node evaluation is a very important uh, aspect for some of these sites now just to touch upon the various uh, principles in the orbit the incidence of lymph node metastasis is less than 3% so lymph node biopsy is not recommended routinely in the non paramen paramenial sites and the nor non orbital uh, paramenial sites the incidence is again less than 15% so a routine biopsy of clinically negative right one biopsy is any suspiciously enlarged nodes and if positive this area must be included in the uh, portal uh, the radiotherapy portal for the genito urinary tract in the bladder prostate vagina vulva and uterus no lymph node sampling is recommended while in the paratesticular uh, site paratesticular rms the incidence of lymph node uh, positivity is sufficiently higher that is around 30 to 50% but in this we have realized that a good ct scan of the retroperitoneum is very good and nodes which are more than equal to 2 cm on ct scan have been shown to be mostly positive and therefore they are taken as positive and lymph node biopsy is not done if the node on ct scan is less than 2 cm or there are no lymph nodes present on ct scan then the chances of nodes being positive is less than 15% then again no biopsy is required so in irs4 study they had come out with this clear cut recommendation that retroperitoneal lymph node sampling routinely is not required for paratesticular rms but it means that you should have a good ct scan of the retroperitoneum i am not talking about retroperitoneal lymph node dissection which we will discuss uh, under the paratesticular treatment the extremities and trunk again is very important because the incidence of lymph node positivity is more than 50% and accurate assessment is therefore very important the lymph node positivity has a major impact on the treatment outcome and also the treatment the lymph node positive sites have to be included in the radiotherapy portal otherwise local recurrence will take place the three year overall survival is 80% in lymph node negative cases as compared to 46% in lymph node positive cases this has been shown over a large number of uh, cog trials so in the lower extremity the femoral triangle is sampled and in the upper extremity the axilla is sampled even if the lymph nodes are not palpable clinically one needs to sample the lymph nodes at these sites supra clavicular lymph node in the upper extremity and iliac or para aortic lymph nodes in the lower extremity is considered distant metastasis and is called stage 4 disease so one must be aware of this now the role of pet scan uh, whether pet scan can you know avoid lymph node uh, sampling is still not clear a pet negative does not mean always that the lymph nodes are negative still so one is still trying to fine tune the pet scan and the role of sentinel lymph node mapping is still being studied and hopefully in the future uh, with good uh, quality of these scans and good studies we may avoid lymph node sampling but as of now the lymph node sampling is the standard of care 
So if we summarize the lymph node evaluation, surgical sampling of radiologically negative lymph nodes is only required for all extremity RMS and all paratesticular RMS in children more than 10 years of age. As I mentioned, in children less than 10 years of age, the size of the lymph node will guide uh, as to the probability. But in children more than 10 years of age, the incidence is higher. And if it is even if it is radiologically negative, one needs to sample these nodes and possibly do ipsilateral lymph node dissection also. Now, a few words on the primary excision. So, primary re-excision. What is primary re-excision? Is excision of the tumor again. So, it, because incidence of microscopic residual disease is around 35%. Especially when a mass in the extremity or trunk or in the head and neck region has been excised, not thinking that it is an RMS or an oncologic disease. So, obviously, the margins are very close and the chances of microscopic residual disease are very high. And uh, that will... So, it is essential that the surgeon performs excision again and gets a clear microscopic negative margins so as to reduce the intensity of therapy and induce uh, and reduce the uh, relapse rate. This is helpful in children less than three years of age, because especially in these small children, if you get microscopic negative margins, then radio local radiotherapy can be avoided and its long term effects on growth uh, and development can also be avoided. So there is a sur definite survival advantage of PRE, especially in the extremities, as shown that three-year overall survival is 91% uh, <clears throat> for microscopic positive patients who have undergone a PRE versus 74% for those not undergoing PRE. So basically, primary re-excision of the tumor takes priority over all other mortalities. And this is very important for us to remember because often we get patients who have been excised somewhere else. We don't know about the margins. The margins have not been marked and we're not sure. And no form of radiology, CT or MRI can tell us about microscopic positive margin. Often in extremities and trunk, one has to go in again and confirm histological microscopic negative margins in these patients before we start on any chemotherapy or radiotherapy for these patients. And sometimes we... we you know, because of lack of time or lack of knowledge, we don't do this and then we land up with a high rate of local recurrence in these patients. Second look operations. So, this, these are operations which are done after new adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, because after new adjuvant chemotherapy, clinical and radiological evaluation is not accurate. So, SLO aims to provide a complete resection of the tumor after new adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, it has been shown that when we achieve radiological CR, then still in 10 to 15% of these patients, there are viable tumors. And conversely, when a tumor has only achieved a PR or has been shown to be non-responsive clinically and radiologically, and you do a second look operation, we may find no viable tumors in a large number of these patients. So it, a second look operation is important, especially in the extremities, retroperitoneum and trunk in these sites. Now, a uh, few words on the primary tumor excision. We go side by side because the, the principles are slightly different for various tumors. Overall, we must understand that there is no role of tumor debulking. What is debulking? So, the definitions for resection in RMS is excision of less than 50% volume is called a biopsy. And so, the tumor becomes CG3, clinical group 3, biopsy only. Excision of more than 50%, but with gross tumor residue is called debulking. Again, it becomes a CG3. So, unless one is sure that one can achieve a gross complete resection, better if you can achieve a microscopic negative margin, one should not attempt a resection up front. So, gross complete excision with microscopic residue is CG2, as I showed in the chart, and gross complete resection with microscopic negative margins is only CG1. And this CG1 comes in, in, in the favorable sites, in the unfavorable sites, in the low risk subset A with minimal uh, chemotherapy and often no radiotherapy. So one must always aim for gross and microscopic negative margins of tumor. One must avoid extensive mutilating surgery at the outset because this is a very chemosensitive tumor. 
everyone can <clears throat> do a better job after new adjuvant chemotherapy and one must not jump into uh, trying to excise everything. One must try to preserve the function and cosmesis. In extremity tumors, as it was said in the past, now it is clear that compartmental resection is not necessary as long as a negative margin can be achieved. And so uh, in the past, 30 years back, it was compartment resection, but now it is not required. Now, head and neck region, uh, mostly non-surgical treatment uh, is adequate for all orbital RMS. And in these orbital RMS, biopsy is followed by chemo and radiotherapy with more than 90% survival. Orbital excentration is only required for recurrent or residual disease. At other head and neck uh, sites, again, a is followed by chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And then the resection of residual disease may be considered and done and with whatever reconstruction is required in these patients. This is one of the examples who had a huge tumor which shrunk to this size after neurojuvent chemotherapy. And though the excision is a small area, but in head and neck area, uh, regions, you need to do a lot of reconstruction flaps to actually properly cover the uh, tumor. In the extremities, again, upfront resection should only be done if one can ensure complete resection, especially with negative margins. Otherwise, there's an initial biopsy, which could be an incisional biopsy or a poor needle biopsy done. And then uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy is given. Following that new adjuvant chemotherapy, a limb sparing wide local excision is done for the tumors and with lymph node biopsy. So um, if there's a doubt, as I already mentioned, tumor patient has come from outside, or if you have doubt on your own resection, then a primary re-excision of tumor is the way to go for all these patients. Amputation is now rarely done. It is reserved for patients in whom the neurovascular bundle is involved or if there's a local recurrence which cannot be re-excised or cannot be treated adequately. And sometimes it is done for pain control in weight-bearing limbs uh, when the pain relief cannot be achieved. And that is usually because of neurovascular involvement. Now, in the bladder and prostate area, again, pelvic excentration is hardly ever required now, but it is not that low. Still, I will show later on. Partial cystectomy upfront can be done for tumors arising from the dome of the bladder, as in this example, where you can see this bladder and a huge tumor arising from the dome of the bladder. And this was uh, can be resected uh, upfront in these patients. For most other bladder prostate uh, abdominal sarcoma, as seen here, involving the bladder prostate areas in the MCU, these patients uh, uh, do not go upfront surgery. They will get new adjuvant chemotherapy, a large number of these patients will achieve CR on chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And after chemotherapy, the excision of residual nodule can be done as a second look operation. But still, radical cystectomy and prostatectomy may be required for some patients for poor response or for resurgence of tumor after initial response. This is an example of a patient in whom the tumor had completely disappeared after chemotherapy and radiotherapy. <clears throat> now, uh, so bladder preservation without compromising the survival rate is the way to go. In IRS-3, 64% of the survivors had the intact bladders. But one must realize that in the same study, 34% of the survivors had to undergo cystectomy for salvage because of... Um, residual disease. So it is not always possible to uh, conserve the bladder. Now we look at some of these cases in genitourinary RMS to again reaffirm our principles of therapy. This is the patient in whom I said there was a tumor from the dome of the bladder and this was ex excised uh, up front. There's a large necrotic tumor from the dome of the bladder and the biopsy came out as embryonal uh, RMS spindle cell variety from the dome of the bladder and the microscopic margins were negative. And the metastatic workup in this patient was negative. So how do we uh, stage this patient? So clinical grouping is group 1A, because it is confined to the organ, completely resected. ENM staging, it is an unfavorable site. 
bladderprostate, no non-invasive, size is more than 5 centimeters, nodes negative, and no metastasis. So it is TNM stage 3. We mark it on the table. Then we go to risk categorization. TNM stage 3, CG1 or 2, unfavorable site, it becomes a low risk subset B. And that will dictate the treatment that the patient gets. So the final diagnosis is spindle cell embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma of the bladder dome, CG1A, TNM stage 3, low risk subset B. This is how the complete diagnosis of these patients are made. And the low risk subset B, as I said, in this, uh, in this the treatment uh, which is followed is the VAC chemotherapy for uh, 42 weeks and uh, with uh, or without radiotherapy, depending on the various other factors. So another, uh, so this patient, interestingly, got the joint chemotherapy for 42 weeks, did not get radiotherapy, and there was a complete uh, response and was followed up uh, for a long period. In December 2016, which was five years of follow-up after the CR achieved, the patient reported frequency of maturation, was advised to undergo an ultrasound, MCU, and neurodynamics. This is the MCU picture. I'm highlighting these to uh, re-emphasize that all is not well. Even after achieving CR, there are problems. The ultrasound showed upper tracts to be normal, but the bladder was small capacity and there was no postpartum residue. The MCU also showed the same thing, no VUR, but small capacity bladder. The urodynamics in this patient <coughs> show a very low capacity, poorly compliant bladder with high pressure systems with no uninhibited contraction. So this is a very high risk uh, patient now. Because with time, the upper tracts will deteriorate and the patient may land up with CKD. How to avoid these? These patients are initially put on oxybutynin and looking at the response, some of these patients would require a late augmentation. So again, highlighting the point, as I mentioned earlier, that all conserved bladders anatomically are not normal physiologically and we need to follow up these patients. Now we look at another case of bladder prostate RMS. This is a three-year-old child with hematuria who on ultrasound showed a bladder mass. MCU, this, these x-rays I've shown previously also had metastatic disease and then uh, core needle biopsy showed an internal RMS. So CG4 because of metastatic disease, TNM stage 4 because of metastatic disease, and risk category high again because of metastatic disease. So ultimate diagnosis is abdominal rhabdomyosarcoma, bladder prostate, CG4 stage 4, high risk category. And again, the treatment he gets is 42 weeks of VAC chemotherapy with local radiotherapy. And then if required, exigen of the residual. So this patient uh, got the treatment and external being radiotherapy. At the end of treatment, the patient was in complete uh, uh, response. There was no residual tumor. This is the, the and the, this child is disease free at 18 years, and uh, he doesn't have any urinary symptoms. But unfortunately, his azoospermic has bilateral sacroiliac joint arthritis, which is probably radiotherapy induced. So again, long-term complications uh, in these patients and so they need to be followed up. So uh, again, bladder prostate RMS, as I said, excision of residual nodule may be required after new joint chemotherapy. Radical cystectomy and prostatectomy may be required in up to 30% of the patients because of poor response or progression of disease. Another case of an eight-year-old boy, this is interesting, as happens often in our country, Patient operated for a right testicular mass four months back somewhere else and came to us with progressive abdominal distension and uh, on, on uh, investigation was uh, noted to have a large retropidal lymph nodal uh, masses with inguinal mass, liver metastasis in the mediastinum and in the lungs. So metastatic disease. Now we don't know whether it is a residual disease or a, or a, or a, uh, a different disease because initially workup has not been done. So there is the importance of doing a complete workup with these patients to know where the patient stands before we touch them. So the final diagnosis of this patient was paratesticular embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, either recurrent or progressive, with involvement of the spermatic cord, retroperitoneal nodes, liver, bilateral lungs, mediastinum, and left supraclavicular lymph node, which is also present. So again, high-risk patient in this. But in this patient, as compared to the bladder prostate uh, RMS, this is a favorable site. Paratesticular site is a favorable site amongst the genitourinary sites. 
So this patient, though he is high risk and he gets 42 weeks of VAC chemotherapy, but the outcome is expected to be better in these patients. So after nine weeks of, uh, of uh, chemotherapy, patient underwent local therapy in the form of right hemiscrotectomy with resection of the remnant spermatic cord and resection of the single large retropedial node. So nine weeks, everything had disappeared, liver, lungs. This is a lungs after nine weeks, complete disappeared. Uh, so after excision of this, the patient was rendered in CR and he completed his uh, 42 weeks of uh, VAC chemotherapy, was, was given radiotherapy uh, to the retropedilum in the post-op period. At the end of 42 weeks, he was in CR. And at in December 2022, when he last followed up with us, nine years, four months from diagnosis, he has uh, no difference and normal renal functions. So again, to highlight the surgical principles in paratesticular RMS, CT evaluation of retropedilum nodes and lungs is mandatory. Radical inguinal or technique should be done. One should avoid scrotal contamination and transcrotal biopsy or excision of any scrotal mass should be avoided. The role of hemispherectomy after scrotal violation is uh, again debated as the, one of the studies, uh, German study showed that there was no difference in five-year event-free survival whether scrotectomy was done or not done after scrotal violation. Ipsilateral lymph node dissection is required only in children greater than 10 years of age and these uh, follow the adult principles and they also get uh, radiotherapy to the retropedium. And this is only ipsilateral retropedilin lymph node dissection because retropedilin lymph node dissection carries its own problems. Another case of a 14-year-old girl who presented with menorrhagia and a mass protruding from the vagina. This uh, patient ultrasound showed a large uh, uterine mass with mass uh, from the cervix. The MR showed a uterine mass and the biopsy of this polyp, which was hanging from the vagina, showed embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. The metastatic workup was normal in this patient. So again, staging this patient is stage 3 because it has a biopsy only. Clinical, that is CG3 and TNM stage 1 because it's a favorable site. As I said, amongst the genital urinary sites, paratesticular, uterus, vulva are all favorable sites. The bladder prostate is a non-favorable site. So TNM stage 1, risk category, low, sub, low risk category in, in this patient. And this patient was treated again with back chemotherapy. And in the uh, genital urinary uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, especially in the uh, vagina and vulva and uh, uterus, one must be very conserv conservative and not try to do resection in these patients. In fact, now the surgical resection is only contemplated at the end of therapy, that is after 42 weeks. So this is the patient, he, she achieved CR very early in the treatment in this patient. This is another patient of polyps hanging out of the vagina, young child. Mostly young children have vaginal uh, RMS while the older children have uterine RMS. So again, a low-risk uh, patient and they do very well with chemotherapy and surgery is really required in these patients. And whenever surgery is done, it should be very, very conservative. So to reiterate the surgical principles of vagina, uterus and vulva, which is a favorable site amongst the genital urinary RMS, the initial CT scan, vaginal urethroscopy, and a biopsy, new adjuvant chemotherapy, repeat examination and biopsy, local limited resection sometimes if there's a gross residue uh, present. Hysterectomy and vaginectomy is only rarely required. And if hysterectomy is done, the ovaries should be preserved. If vaginectomy is done, then it should all, nearly always be a partial vaginectomy preserving the rest of the vagina. Radical hysterectomy and vaginectomy may be required, but it's very rare, usually for children who have no response or have early disease progression. And consider radiotherapy for all in these patients because current studies have shown that if we avoid radiotherapy in these patients for the fear of um, uh, dysfunction of the uterus, then uh, the local recurrence rates are higher. So radiotherapy should be given. It could be avoided in very small children where more intensive chemotherapy is then used uh, in con conjunction with conservative surgery. So to conclude, unfortunately, there has not been much improvement in survival over the last five decades of trials. There has been minor changes in the dosage and, and uh, the cumulative doses, especially for the metastatic parameters. And so the search is on for better and more effective agents, which 
a lot of chemotherapeutic agents have been tried, but now the whole research is towards molecular targeted therapies and immunotherapies. And the five-year overall survival for the last couple of decades has hung around 69% event fee survival and 79% overall survival, which actually doesn't look very nice uh, when you look at tumors like Wim's tumor or hepatoblastoma. And metastatic disease, the survival is poorer with an event fee survival of 30% and overall survival of 42%. So uh, this is the bottom line, and this is where we stand today. So uh, surgical principles are all good. The most important thing to highlight is don't jump in, try to resect these tumors. Chemotherapy is very good. So uh, these are the various targeted uh, work which is going on, looking at uh, various pathways, the RTK signaling pathway, apoptotic pathway, or tube. So, so there are a lot of pathways which have been targeted and a lot of research is going on. Where have we reached now? You look at all these studies which are going on, phase one, phase two trials, some, only a couple of them now may come into phase three trials, but there are a lot of uh, paths that have been explored, both as targeted and as in immunotherapy. Uh, in, in so neoadjuvant therapies have proven capable of shrinking and even eradicating some of the primary tumors. Surgical procedures are less uh, apt to be extensive or mutilating in uh, children. So in the end, a well-planned multimodal therapy with appropriate surgical intervention at appropriate time is the key to less morbidity and mortality and a better quality of life in these children with Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, that was very informative and very exhaustive. Uh, there are some, uh, there are some uh, questions in the chat, sir. Would you like to answer them? Yeah, I am just going through them. Uh, uh, okay. So Akshay asks, after new adjuvant chemotherapy, if tumor regression is not satisfactory, is the role of new adjuvant RT to achieve R0 resection, or is it better to go for R1 resection? So uh, if resection is feasible without mutilation, then one must go for resection, and that is now the local therapy is now said to be around 12 weeks. In the previous VAC chemotherapy, it was eight, nine weeks. Now they say at 12 weeks, you reassess and look at this. Uh, if it is easy, is resectable and you can assure R0 resection, one should go for resection. Or one can add radiotherapy preoperatively and then go for resection. Or one can do the resection and then go for postoperative radiotherapy. If at this juncture, the tumor is still not resectable safely, I mean, the function will be affected and cost versus will be affected, one must go for radical RT. So the standard RT dose is around 36 uh, grays, while the radical RT dose is around 51.4 grays. So the local therapy will be, will be by radiotherapy in these patients. And uh, so these patients who receive local rad radical radiotherapy have been shown to do poorly, but that is there is a bias in this because there are already the poor, poor risk patients because of poor response. How many lymph nodes, this is again Akshay, how many lymph nodes excite is consider, considered adequate? In, uh, there is nothing, unlike the Wim's tumor or other tumors, there is nothing uh, in numbers, but the local regional draining lymph node needs to be excised. Studies are there for sentinel uh, mapping of lymph nodes using either the blue dye or also uh, radionuclide uh, and gamma camera. And then one can choose and uh, do the lymph node biopsies in these patients. But definitely for extremities, lymph node biopsy is required. That is the only site where actually it matters, except for uh, uh, more than 10 years paratesticular tumors. How much margin should be considered adequate in PRE? So there is no margin in centimeters because uh, the margin that you can achieve in head and neck is very less. And uh, one can confirm by doing frozen section. Or more importantly, one should very clearly mark out the tumor and the standard marking is uh, done with two uh, sutures, long, lateral, and short, superior. So the tumor is marked in this way. There's a long uh, suture put on the lateral mm -hmm. and a short suture put in the superior aspect. That gives the... And once you resect it, especially in extremities, then it's a good idea to resect tissue from all around the margin and send it separately to actually delineate that the margins are negative. Uh, in these patients. Then, uh, uh, 
So patient coming very late after huge mass is of great concern. Yes, it is. And as I said, in the TNM staging, anything more than five centimeters becomes B. And in the unfavorable sites, um, it go, goes into high risk. And larger the tumor, the more difficult it is to achieve a CR in these patients. And um, so obviously it is bad in these patients. Dr. Shilpa asks, uh, Akshay activity on PET scan is seen for viability surgery if active. So uh, I would counter this by saying that PET scan is now being used left, right and center. But for RMS, there is no definite study which has corroborated PET with positivity. So there are a lot of false negatives in PET and there are a lot of false positives in PET. Especially in our country where tuberculosis is very common, a PET positive lymph node could be a tubercular lymph node. So again, we come back to biopsy and it does not decide on resection of the primary tumor, PET activity. And as I mentioned, that radiologically, whether it is PET or CT or MR, when the tumors are radiologically negative or achieved CR, still 10 to 15% of the patients will have viable tumors. And there is the role for second look surgery. And sometimes when you think the tumor is left and there's only a partial response, and when we go in and dissect uh, as a second look surgery, and to our surprise that nearly 30% of the patients or more than 30%, 50% of the patients will actually be in CR, in histological CR. Dr. Lakshmi is asking, is there need for uretic stenting before chemotherapy of bladder-based tumors? This is a very important question. And often with bladder-based tumors, we find that there is back pressure changes and there's hydro-uretronephrosis or hydronephrosis. Now, one has to be very careful when these patients have hydronephrosis. At the time of cystoscopy, one can take a biopsy and put in a uretic stent if possible. Often, it is not possible to put a uretic stent. If not possible, then before starting chemotherapy, one must do PCN on the hydronephrotic kidney because uh, we are giving cyclophosphamide, which can cause a lot of uh, hemorrhagic uh, complications in these patients and the kidney functions will deteriorate by the time the tumor responds. So it is a good idea for putting uh, draining the kidney somehow. So if stents are not possible, mm -hmm. then do PCN in these patients, unilateral or bilateral. We have done those, which comes out in about eight to nine weeks. And uh, that is all. And then uh, Dr. Lakshmi is asking role of ovarian transposition. Yes, again, a very important question. And we have done that in a large number of patients. If he is uh, contemplated for the pelvis, then we uh, laparoscopically transpose the ovaries out of the pelvis and anchor them uh, the abdominal wall inside with the which is coming out in the subcutaneous area. And once the uh, radiotherapy is done, we touch the subcutaneous area and remove that stitch and the ovary falls back into place. So that is what we have done in a number of patients. And this for the testicular transposition also, the testicles can be transposed up or into the inguinal near the iliac crest. Then... Uh, uh, can you please elaborate on the pre-treatment biopsy and IHC? So, uh, mode of biopsy, as I mentioned, is mostly now uh, radiologically guided, ultrasound or CT guided, core needle biopsy. And then the pathologist performed the routine IHC, so Desmin and Myogenin, to get at a diagnosis. The definite diagnosis of allular RMS is by the, the translocation studies, as I mentioned, the fusion uh, studies, the PAX-3, uh, FOXO-1 or PAX-7, FOXO-1. And this should be done routinely now to definitely... Uh, when you have a non-specific kind of a sarcoma and one does a loss of heterozygosity at 15.5 uh, uh, locus, if it is positive, then it is more, more likely to be an embryonal abnormal sarcoma than in any other sarcoma. So what is the further follow-up? A review investigation, counseling to be done when, uh, for, for a girl 23 years ago, operated for bladder RMS. So uh, routine uh, post completion of therapy, we look at these patients three monthly. So we do a CT scan and ultrasound alternatively. So two CT scans and two ultrasound in the first year, then six monthly for two years, and then annually thereafter. And beyond five years, long-term recurrences are still known in RMS. 
so one has to look for recurrences but in a girl who was who was treated 23 years ago we are now looking at fertility status and complications of pregnancy and uh, of ovarian failure and uh, like and obviously as i mentioned in this talk also we have to look at the uh, urinary tract the bladder is it okay is the is it high pressure system how are the upper tracts what is the gfr and then accordingly uh, you know advise these patients and they may need intervention at times so all these patients even if the ovary is transposed up or not up all with all the chemotherapy especially cyclophosphamide the number of uh, germinal cells become less so they are going to go into menopause very early so it is better to advise these young girls to start a family early if they want to start a family because you don't know when the ovarian failure will occur in these patients and now the with a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, ovum preservation and all but they are very expensive and uh, not done in very small children but in adolescents one can do that and uh, then later on come with artificial uh, methods for pregnancy uh, kamal is asking please elaborate whether tumor lysis syndrome is a concern yes it is a concern in some of the patients which are rapidly growing tumors in the patient of paratesticular rms which i showed in this example this patient nearly died because of tumor lysis syndrome fortunately we were able to save him by giving raspuricase and uh, one must look for tumor lysis syndrome look at the uric acids look at the uh, electrolytes and one must be aware hydration is a very important point in preserving in in preventing tumor lysis syndrome so though it can be given as a day care the first dose uh, we always give after admission because we need to keep a track of these patients and a lot of patients have a very rapidly growing large tumors and the larger tumors the more chances of uh, tumor lysis syndrome but the incidence of tumor lysis is not as high as it is seen in leukemics uh, for solid tumors it is definitely lower uh, for a and dr shilpa is again asking is there any role of cystectomy today yes as i mentioned even in the irs studies nearly 65 or 2/3 of the patients had bladder conservation but 1/3 of them still needed a cystectomy because of either uh, progressive disease or the tumor being present at such a location the residual tumor that the bladder neck and the and the trigone would go <coughs> which would basically means nearly a non functional bladder or small bladder so cystectomy is still required one must not um, shy away from the fact and unfortunately in this aspect in the second case which i showed bladder prostate rms when we advised at 9 weeks for resection because the bladder neck was involved and we told them that the patient may become incontinent or may require cic for life the patients refused surgery and this is a very common happening in india that the patients would refuse uh, cystectomy young patients because after all it has a long lot of uh, connotation and then you are forced to continue giving uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and to a surprise uh, a lot of patients achieve cr so uh, in fact i have started thinking whether cystectomy uh, or e Re, uh, surgical second look surgery in bladder prostate rms is at all required and we presented our data in the sio meeting which was held in um, toronto and uh, we have always questioned uh, trying to do surgery very early and uh, get into problems uh, because we were forced into continuing chemotherapy for a long term and uh, we have a lot of patients who achieve cr just by chemotherapy and radiotherapy but obviously some of them have long term complications so i don't see dr yogender is asking in testicular tumor pre op can you differentiate between germ cell tumors and abnormal sarcoma that is uh, obvious because 95% of germ cell tumors will have a raised alpha fetoprotein that is the first test that should be done when you get a testicular mass and if the alpha fetal protein is negative then one must suspect whether it is an rms uh, or not and then uh, biopsy may a core needle biopsy may help you in that so that's all if there is anything more that i need to you can please um, email me whatsapp me i am there and uh, we can even uh, do this later on so thank you again 
for giving me this opportunity to talk on RMS. Thank you very much, sir. If there are uh, no more questions uh, or no more queries, I think, uh, thank you very much. That was a very lucid talk, very uh, vast with, with most of the questions are uh, the topics, the risks, and uh, this, uh, it, it, it was very informative in the sense that most of the questions which we always had a problem in diagnosing a different thing or what could be done, you put it, your perspectives are very clear. And I think as we saw the meeting chat, we had more than 100 participants and uh, this 100 participants was the limits today. So I think many of them couldn't join. So I think with your permission, if this, I think Sanjay Rao, is, sir, has recorded this, it will be available in the IAPS uh, YouTube channel, sir. Can we, we will be putting, we'll, we'll talk to sir and it will be available there. I okay. Think many of them, I because only, we could only, 100 of the, we could only uh, admit 100 of them. I think okay. next can try to do it in the YouTube channel, sir. So I think uh, we can request uh, our secretary to increase the limits because as these talks, webinars will become more uh, common, a lot of more people would like to join in. So 100 may be less <laughs> in times to come. I think what we can do is we can stream it on YouTube, sir. That's the other advantage okay. we can do. Okay. okay. Yes. yes. Good. Right. Thank, Thank you again. Good, day. Good night, you. sir. Thank you very much. Good, Good night.